Welcome to the Dino Six Pack Dynasty Football Podcast. I'm your host, Jordan Schultz. Um, and due to a little bit of a scheduling conflict, I will be doing this show solo today. Um, so what we are going to do today, um, you know, after every week, but especially after week one, there's so much new information that comes out. There's so much to process. Um, it can be kind of hard to figure out like what's important and what's just kind of fluff when it comes to making moves for your dynasty leagues. Um, so what I'm going to go today, what I'm going to do today here is I'm going to go through every single game and kind of go over my number one biggest like dynasty takeaway um, and kind of talk about if it's like an overreaction or if it's something that you need to take note of. Um, Cause I think a lot of the stuff that like, depending how, you know, what podcasts and what articles and what sites you like, you may hear a lot of conflicting information on these same exact storylines. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go in here and talk about where I come in onto all of those. Um, so before we get started here, um, as you can kind of see scrolling across the bottom right now, um, we have memberships available over at Fantasy Six Pack. Um, head on over to fantasysixpack.net slash plans. Um, you get so much stuff for your money there. Um, you're going to get your award-winning rankings. Um, we have stuff for betting and DFS. Um, best of all, um, you get access to our Discord forum um, where pretty much all of our analysts are active. You can go in there, ask questions that are specific to your fantasy leagues. Um, and you'll get answers, you know, they're kind of tailored specifically for like what you need. Um, it's really a lot of fun. Um, pretty much everybody that's in there, I think, would say it's well worth their money. Um, everything you get for their uh, membership, you know, on top of all that, you get all access to all of my Dynasty uh, rookie ranks that will be updated twice a week um, as well. Or excuse me, every every second week they'll be updated. And then every Monday morning, I will have a weekly recap. Um, it's kind of like a more fantasy and dynasty focused written version of this column. We'll kind of go a little bit from instead of just one takeaway overall, take away one takeaway kind of from each team. Um, so yeah, um, with all that being said here, uh, let's get it going. So of course, first game that happened this week, um, we got to see back on Thursday, uh, the Detroit Lions took down the Kansas City Chiefs 21 to 20. Um, a bit of a shocker here. You know, I, I thought the Chiefs would come out and win. Um, even after the news of Kelsey came out, I figured they would still find a way to get it done. Um, and I was wrong. Detroit came out. They played awesome. Um, in terms of what I'm looking at for Dynasty Leagues here is, you know, uh, D- David Montgomery. Um, he came out. He outtouched Jameer Gibbs 21-9. to um, And, is, you know, is he going to continue to outtouch him 2-1 to one the rest of the season? Um, and I would say that's a bit of an overreaction. Um I will say that David Montgomery, like, I think he is going to have a role every single week where he's getting 15 touches minimum. Um, so I think that you're probably going to have to wait till the end of this year, maybe even the year two before you see Jameer Gibbs take over and have the majority of the touches out of this backfield. Um, with that all being said, though, like, I'm honestly not that worried about it. It was pretty clear that Gibbs was a far more explosive player out of the two. Um, so I think once he gets up to where he's, you know, you know, up from his nine touches he had this week up to just like 12 to 15. Like he's going to be a pretty consistent lock for double digit fantasy points every week. You know, when he has a touchdown or two added in there, then, you know, bump that up into the twenties. Um, so yeah, David Montgomery is a real thing. He's going to be like a low end RB two flex play. Um, but if you're a Gibbs older Gibbs owner in dynasty, just hold on better days are ahead. Um, he's going to improve quite a bit moving forward here. Uh, moving on to our next game here. Um, we have the Ravens and the Texans. Uh, Ravens took them down 25 to nine here. Um, takeaway I'm looking at here um, is Zay Flowers as a legitimate day one star, and he's going to anchor the passing attack outside of Mark Andrews. And I'm going to say this is something you need to take note of, honestly. Um, I've been a Zay Flowers fan from the very start. Um, he was my wide receiver three in my pre-draft process. I kept him there post-draft. Um, even after they brought in uh, Odell Beckham, oh, I really wasn't too worried about it. I was like, man, Zay Flowers, he is the most talented guy in this receiving group, and I think that it's going to be pretty quick. You're going to see he's the number one option in, in week one. We saw that. Um, granted, you know, he may see a little bit less volume once Mark Andrews comes back, um, but I mean, he's the best talent here. I mean, anyone that uh, – watched him play and i mean and you can go uh find the written version of this article i embedded a tweet on there it just shows how shifty he is with the ball in his hands he's gonna have a huge year in this baltimore offense um so that is that is something that i am going to be taking note of here I, I think that zay flowers is like a legitimate fantasy starter every single week from here on out moving on to our next game here this was a bit of an ugly one um, where the commanders took down the cardinals 20 to 16. um this game, I mean, really the Cardinals defense is the only reason they were in this game. They didn't really do much on offense. It was it was pretty rough. I think in, as long as Josh Dobbs is out there, there's not a lot you're going to be able to take away from the Cardinals. Um, but on the commander side here, um, Brian Robinson outtouched Antonio Gibson 20-4, to and he's he looked like he's locked in as a preferred running back in this offense. And I'm going to say that this is something that, like, you got to take note on about 80%. Um, I do think that there's going to be games where they're trailing, and then Antonio Gibson's going to get a little bit more work. Um, but this – Unless things really change here, this might be one of them that I need to take an L on. I was pretty big on Antonio Gibson coming into the year um, and get, only getting four touches in a game like this. This is not 
super encouraging because, I mean, while, while the Washington was up a good chunk of the game, it wasn't like they were blowing him out. Um, so it wasn't like they were in a script where they're just running and running and running. Um, he still was only able to get four touches, um, you know, it's like it's been said so many places, you know, Brian Robinson literally got shot last year in the leg, came back and was solid down the stretch. And, you know, maybe I didn't put enough stock into that. Um, you know, he looked pretty solid there. Um, like I said, 20 to four in touches. I, so I think this is something that you're going to have to take note of. If you were counting on Antonio Gibson's an RB2, you maybe need to adjust that to more of like a, a deep league flex option or by league by week villain until, until things change and he plays a little bit different. I mean, I think Brian Robinson might be the guy there. Uh, moving on to our next game here, we have the 49ers taking down the Steelers 30 to 7. And oh man, this was an ugly game right here. I mean, the Steelers looked completely opposite of that team that we saw for those few preseason drives, um, which there's probably a lesson to be learned in there about, you know, taking too much stock into preseason. Um, but on the 49ers side, man, Brandon Ayuk, he's my own, most owned player across all fantasy leagues. Um, he hauled in all eight of his targets for 129 yards and two touchdowns clear number one option in the passing attack. And that is something that I'm 100% taking note of. Um, you can go back and search my tweets as far as, you know, six, seven months ago. And I've been saying Brandon Ayuk's the number one option in this offense. I've been buying him and drafting him everywhere I could. Uh, so to have a, a huge first week like this is awesome. You know, you never want a victory lap too much just because weird things happen in week one. But I, I don't really think that this is going to be one of those. I think that Brandon Ayuk's legitimately going to be the top option. Even when George Kittle's back, um, the offense is going to run through Christian McCaffrey and Brandon Ayuk. Um, so, I mean, you really can't, couldn't have asked for much better of a start there if you're an IU guy. Um, he was targeted early and often, made an awesome catch on that second touchdown where he kind of caught around the defender in the end zone. Um, I just, yeah, I think that 12, 1300 yards and 10 touchdowns is most likely what Brandon IU is headed for this year. And you got to be feeling good if you have him on your squad. Moving on to our next game here. This was a close one here. We had the Saints taking down the Titans 16 to 15. Um, and this is another belief that I've kind of held for a little bit. And, you know, week one didn't do anything to sway my thoughts on that. Um, and that is that I think that just Ryan Tannehill is, he's not, not that great anymore. And I think it's only a matter of time before they transition into the Malik Willis and Will Levis era. Um, and really kind of focus on the youth, you know, build around Tajay Spears. He looks good. And this is something that I'm taking note of about, again, about 80% here. Um, just, you know, I, I won't put it past Rabel to, to put together a great coaching job where he's able to rally them and they're able to get seven, eight, nine wins. And then they just keep riding out there for this year and they try and compete for one of those last wild card spots. Um, but I, I do also see a world where it goes really bad and they start seeing what they have in some of the young guys. Um, and then at that point, you kind of have to wonder what happens to Derrick Henry, DeAndre Hopkins. Um, obviously, if you're Tajay Spears, a trail on Burks owner, you're, you're real happy about that. Um, but I do, I think that this team is going to be in a, a team that did not a lot of transition here pretty quickly. If not this year, definitely going to next off season. Um, just not a big fan of this Titans offense and the week one performance from Ryan Tannehill did not do a lot to, to uh, get rid of those fears for me. You know, it just made me feel a little bit stronger and kind of what I was thinking there. Um, so we'll see how it goes on that one, but yeah, definitely something I'm monitoring and I'm taking note of here on this one. Moving on to our next game here, uh, we have the Buccaneers taking down the Vikings 20 to 17. And man, this was another one that was a bit of a shocker. Um, this is one of them I have two takeaways from that I kind of want to focus on here. <clears throat> I think I had two games where this was the case. Um, first one is on the Buccaneers side, uh, Mike Evans and Chris Godwin, are gonna, Godwin will maintain PPR flex value this season, which I would kind of consider top 36 uh, for PPR. Um and I'm going to say, yeah, you need to take note of that. I, I don't think that they're even really high-end wide receiver twos, but I do think they're both really solid flex options that they're going to have weeks where they have a touchdown or two, and then that's going to get bumped up to where you're getting solid wide receiver two numbers out of your flex spot. Um, when you think about it, I mean, Baker Mayfield didn't do anything overly spectacular, but he did more than enough for them to win the game. Um, best receiving core that he's ever played with. I don't think that's even really much of a question. Um you know, looking at what they did, Mike Evans, I believe, had six catches. Um, Chris Godwin had five. I think they called in like 11 of their 16 targets. And I do, I think that something's going to happen quite a bit this year. I was a little bit low on Rashad White. I think he's going to be better than what he showed today. Um, but I think a big chunk of the passing attack is going to run through those two, especially now that Russell Gage is out. So I think if you are counting on Evans or Godwin for flex or even some like bye week wide receiver two production, I think you can feel okay about that. Um, showed enough that unless there's just a complete meltdown these next few weeks that I think that you can count on them for this season, which I was a little bit worried about coming and I wasn't really sure what version of Baker we would get. 
Moving on to the next game here, in a game that was a little bit closer than what the scoreboard shows here, uh, the Jaguars took down the Colts 31-21. to um, And kind of the one thing, another one, I think I got to take an L on here. I was real skeptical of Calvin Ridley. Um, love the talent. It's just I don't know many guys that take that much time away from the game and are able to come back and just you know demand a target share that makes them a must-start wide receiver one for fantasy every single week. I might be wrong. He looked awesome. You know, Trevor Lawrence looked his way a ton. I think that if you were able to grab him third, fourth, fifth round, I think that you got to be feeling real good. And there's a chance that he returns second, third round value. So you're going to be, you're going to be doing good on that one. You know, Trevor Lawrence, he looked exactly like we thought that second touchdown he threw to Zay Jones was spectacular. Um, I think that if you invested in this Jaguars offense all around, man, you got to be feeling really, really good. Um, so yeah, I mean, Calvin Ridley being a legit wide receiver one for fantasy purposes, I, I think you need to take note of that. I mean, I think it's more kind of low end. Ideally, you have him as more of like your wide receiver two or even better, your wide receiver three or flex spot where he went, depending when you're drafted. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something I think you need to take note of. Um, circling back, I told you I had two in the last game and I totally spaced the second one. So switching back to the Bucks and Vikings real quick. Um, on the Viking side here, I got I got a fun one here. I think that uh, Justin Jefferson, Jordan Addison, and TJ Hawkinson are all going to average double-digit fantasy points in PPR leagues, and this is something strongly, strongly taking note of. Um, I'm not really telling any anybody anything that no, nobody already doesn't know um, that Justin Jefferson and TJ Hawkinson are awesome options for your PPR leagues. Um, top you know, in Justin Jefferson's case, top one option at your position, top five for Hawkinson. Um, but Jordan Addison, I, I was big on him. He was my wide receiver too in this class. Um, I figured he would have like kind of some low end flex value, you know, second half of the season, but it's encouraging to see him come out here, you know, hauling four targets, 60 yards, get a touchdown week one. Um, I think it's something where, you know, he's going to average double digit fantasy points and the Vikings, despite not really getting much from their rushing game at all. Um, I think this passing offense is going to be really juicy for fantasy, and there's going to be four four legit fantasy contributors in this offense most week where you can get 10 points out of out of those three receivers that I mentioned. And then Kirk Cousins, especially in Superflex Leagues, firmly in the mix for like high-end quarterback two, and he's going to have these quarterback one uh, weeks mixed in like this one where he throw for like 344 yards or something like that. Um, so, yeah, I'm strongly, strongly taking out of that one. Um, kicking it over to a game that did not go as well, um, I guess, depending what side you're cheering for here. Um, and that was the Browns taking down the Bengals 24 to three. Um, and I mean, yeah, the big thing that I think a lot of talk shows are going to be talking about today is, you know, Burrow and the Bengals offense, man, it looked real, real rough against the Browns. You know, are they primed to take a step back? Did they overachieve a little bit the last few years? Um, and this is something that I am 100% putting in the overreaction category. Um, I, I'm a firm believer in Joe Burrow. I think he's one of the best young quarterbacks in the league. He's my QB three for dynasty. Um, the last few years, you know, for whatever reason, the Bengals have always gotten off to a slow start. Um, for one reason or another, Burrow seems like he misses the preseason. I believe last year had like an appendectomy, you know, this year, of course, had the calf injury. Um, and, you know, they started slow last year. And then you saw them, you know, over the last 12, 13 weeks of the season, they were arguably the best team in the league. Um, and that would not shock me to see them go on a run like this again, you know, three, four weeks. And once Burrow's kind of fully kind of got his preseason weeks, you know, worked back in in the regular season. I think that that's something that you'll see them come back. So, I mean, I doubt this is the case, but if there's like a Jamar Chase owner in your league that's panicking, like obviously go try and buy low on that. But I think most mo most people that have had Chase, unless it's the first time, first year dynasty GM, like they've been through this before, like they're not going to be panicked. But yeah, Bengals offense, they're going to bounce back. Pretty confident that there is better days ahead for these guys here. Um, kicking it over to our next game here. Another weird one here. We got the Falcons taking down the Panthers 24 to 10. Um, and this is another one here where it's kind of like, man, one of these things I've been saying since draft days kind of started to come true. And that's that Tyler Algier is the most important handcuff in fantasy. And I'm 100% taking note of that. Um, I won't even try and lie and tell you, I thought he was going to lead the league and or lead the, lead the Falcons in touches here in week one. Um, but you know, I had, 75 yards, two scores. I, I think there's a good chance that he's going to be flex relevant pretty much every week. I mean, I think Bijan Robinson, I mean, you saw it out there. Like he's special with the ball in his hands. Like he's just, he's just literally built different. Um, so it's not going to be too long before, you know, Bijan's getting the majority of the touches out of that backfield. I mean, you would think Arthur Smith is painstakingly frustrating and trying to figure out what he's going to do on a weekly basis. Um, but I mean, he likes to run the ball. You saw what he's able to do with Derrick Henry in Tennessee. Like, I think Bijan, you know, eventually he's going to take over. But I do think that Algiers is pretty safe for, like, a 
10, 12 touch floor pretty much every single week. And I think he's going to be flex relevant. I think this is going to be one of the better rushing attacks. So I think take note, you know, better days ahead for Bijan, who had a good game as it is. And then Tyler Algier, God, he was going late. He's probably undrafted depending on 10, 12 league. He may even be out there on waivers right now. And he's going to be a flex play most weeks, especially once bye weeks and injuries start to hit. Um, so yeah, Tyler Algier, Tyler Algier, most important handcuff in fantasy, 100% going to be taking note on that one right there. Kicking it over to our next game here, Packers 38, Bears 20. Um, this one, I shouldn't say I'm surprised, but I figured it'd be a little bit closer on the Bears side. They they really didn't do much to get DJ Moore involved, and you got to hope that's just kind of week one getting used to the new team, I guess, but I'm still pretty big on DJ Moore. He'll bounce back. But takeaway that I'm looking at for this game here, uh, Jordan Love, man, 15 for 25, 245 yards, three touchdowns. You know, is this going to be a sign of things to come? You know, is he now a high-end quarterback too for fantasy? I'm going to say it's another one that's like about 80% take note. Um, I was already a little bit higher on this Packers offense than a lot of people, um, but I thought it was going to be more so just because of what we were going to see from A.J. Dillon and then my guy Aaron Jones, which hopefully that hamstring injury that he kind of came up with at the end there isn't serious. It sounds like the comments he made today doesn't sound like it's going to be serious. Um, but, yeah, I think that offense is going to be good. It's going to run through them like we saw today. Um, Got to feel good about Romeo Dobbs. You know, he was battling on a hamstring injury, came down, hauled two touchdowns. Um, Jaden Reed was pretty good. I think he got nicked up, but he should be okay. And then at some point, I'll have Christian Watson coming back into the fold here. Um, so I think that Jordan Love, I mean, another guy going super late in drafts, and I think that you can feel pretty confident with him as a QB2 this year. Um, you know, ideally, you have two better options and you were able to grab him. You drafted early, grabbed him late enough to get him as kind of your third quarterback, and then you can kind of play the matchups there with him, you know, your quarterback two spot. But if you are in a spot where, you know, you have an injury, you know, maybe you're waiting for Kyler to come back. If you need if Jordan Love is like you're feeling for your quarterback too, I think that you don't need to panic. You don't need to make a move. I'm, I'm willing to kind of ride that out and see how it goes. Um, I guess one caveat on that is if Aaron Jones is set to miss a good amount of time, that, that could drop the outlook a little bit because I think that he's consistently underrated and one of the most important parts of that offense, as we saw yesterday, like the times they got him involved, they started going. Um, and I guess one more hot take here. This isn't fantasy related, but I think the Packers and my preseason predictions, I got them taking the last playoff spot, the last wild card, wild card spot in the NFC this year. Um, in week one, man, you know, the bears aren't like a world beater by any means, but feeling pretty good about how they perform this first week here. And Jordan Love, man, he's impressive, man. Packers fans, you know, you don't want to say he's the next Rogers or uh, Brett Favre, but getting three legit possible quarterbacks in a row, man, it's just not even fair. There's some from franchises that can't even get one. It's, Packers fan, man, spoiled. Moving on to our next game here. Uh, we got the Raiders taking down the Broncos 17 to 16. Um, and just, you know, despite pulling out the win here, Josh Jacobs averaged only two and a half yards per carry. Um, are we going to see him take a step back? You know, took the preseason off in a contract dispute. Are we going to see him have a little bit of a down year? And this is, for me, it's an overreaction. I mean, I think the workload was still very much there. Um, so it wasn't like he came in and only got eight touches because his conditioning wasn't there. He got a lot of touches, just, you know, Broncos are, I think going to be one of the, you know, at least the top half of the league defense this year. Um, so there wasn't a ton of running room. Um, Josh Jacobs, I'm still treating him as like kind of like a mid-level RB one, not worried about him better days ahead. He's going to continue to get that workload. Um, Jacoby Myers had a huge game. And if they're going to continue to even get like 80% of what they got out of him today, there's going to be a lot of running room with him and Devonte Adams out there running routes. I mean, Josh Jacobs is going to have room to operate. He can also operate as a pass catcher as well. Um, so yeah, again, you probably don't have anybody panic that much, but if you can go buy low on Josh Jacobs right now, I mean, yeah, definitely go for it. Better days are ahead sooner rather than later on him. Uh, moving on to our next game here, we got the Dolphins taking on the Chargers 36-34 in what was, in my opinion, the most exciting of the game today. Well, as a Cowboys fan, there was a game that was more exciting, but for most people, I'd say this is probably the most exciting one that we had on the day. Um, this is the other game that I have two takeaways from that I kind of want to discuss here. Um, and the first one is uh, Tua Tagovailoa, man. Is he a legit MVP candidate for fantasy and the NFL if he stays healthy and plays 17 games? And yeah, I think this is something you need to take note of. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions surrounding him. You know, of course, anytime you have multiple concussions in one season, you have to really kind of be cautious on that. But as long as they are able to keep him upright and healthy, which they had no problem doing today, he's going to put up huge numbers. You know, went over 400 yards, three touchdowns. You know, you saw Tyreek Hill 
211 yards, two scores. And it's not even like, that's a crazy thing. Like, no, he's not going to have 211 yards, but he's probably going to have three more games this year where he goes for 175 and probably four or five games with two touchdowns. So, yeah, I mean, as long as two is there, man, like you got to feel great if you had him as like your quarterback two. And even if he's your quarterback one and a one quarterback lead, I think you're okay there. Um, So, yeah, legitimate MVP candidate. Just keep that guy healthy and him, Tyreek, um, Jalen Waddle. They got Devin A. Chain coming back. I mean, Raheem Mostert's super quick out there. That's just offense is going to be so good. They have so many different weapons that they can go to. Yeah, take note to Otago. We'll just keep him healthy, man. He's he's here. Um, other takeaway we're looking at from this game is uh, Joshua Kelly. He had 90 yards touchdown. Um, is he more than an Eckler handcuff, or is he like a is he a weekly flex option? Because you know, just kind of handcuff. This is a tough one. I'm going to say at this time, it's more of an overreaction. Um, I think that he's going to get closer to like maybe 30% of the carries and touches um, once we get kind of deeper into the season. I think early in the year, you could see Kelly have some games like this where he's kind of low on flex play. Um, but that is mostly just to keep Eckler healthy for the stretch. Um, I think they want him to be healthy more so in games 11 through 18 than they want him to be in healthy one through 10, you know? Um, so I, I could see early in the year, Josh Kelly having some big games, but I think that ideally um, I'm shopping him to the, the Austin Eckler GM. If I don't have Eckler myself and trying to see if I can get like an RB two, like maybe Tyler Algier, maybe you can go get him. That's someone I think is going to have value all year long, even when they kind of hand over touches to the, the, the running back of the future there. Um, so yeah, I'm going to say this one's still a bit of an overreaction, but if, if you have Austin Eckler, I'd make it a priority to go get him to handcuff him. Cause I mean, Isaiah Spiller looks like he may have just been a miss for a lot of the people in the draft community. Um, and, Joshua Kelly, man, that's the guy I think you want there behind Austin Eckler. Moving on to our next game here. Um, one of the bigger surprises, the Rams taking down the Seahawks 30-13. to 13. Um, <clears throat> It was all doom and gloom surrounding the Rams, you know, right before the season started with Cooper Cup getting injured, kind of lingering, having a setback, and then you hear he's going to talk with a specialist. Maybe it's a nerve issue, not just a hamstring issue. And then they come out and just put it to the Seahawks. You know, the passing attack is just, unstoppable um you have tutu atwell six catches for 119 yards and then puka nakua rookie 10 catches for 119 yards are they must starts for at least the first four weeks while cooper cups out um and this is another one that i'm gonna say um isn't a complete overreaction but if you were saying like one's overreaction and five is strongly take note we're gonna put this one at like a two two and a half like it's it's legit i think that they are both going to be they're going to be the target getters um while cooper cups out but I don't know that you can necessarily expect, you know, 119 yard days out of both of them every single week. Um, if there's one guy here that I want to start more than the other moving forward, I'm going to go with Puka Nakua. Um, we've seen it from Tutu Atwell. I mean, he was a second round pick a few years ago, so they may, you know, finally, maybe he's finally blossomed. I'm a little skeptical of that. I mean, I, Puka Nakua was a guy that I think slipped a little bit in the draft process. I, I won't say he was my guy. I think I had him at like wide receiver, like 18 or 19 on um, the night before the draft. Um, but I'm not shocked to see him come in and putting up numbers like this. There's not a lot of other guys, you know, they got Tyler Higby there. Um, I don't like any of their running backs there. I'm notorious Cam Akers hater. Um, so I think Nakua, you can get away with, with kind of like a deep league flex play and, you know, maybe I'm wrong, maybe 2T will be better, but I think, I think he's more of an overreaction where Nakua is like maybe more in the middle, maybe something a little bit to take note of. Um, you know, guy got a little bit of a little bit of late hype during the draft process and then in the preseason. So maybe he's able to carry that in and be one of Stafford's preferred targets. Um, again, ideally you're not playing him until buys start hitting, but you know, could have some flex value down the road. So in dynasty leagues, maybe go throw out a buy low offer for, I guess it would be buy low, but throw out an offer for Nakua, see if you can get him as a bench option and see what happens there. All right, next game we got here, um, we have the Eagles taking down the Patriots. Um, 25-20, this game was honestly a little bit closer than I thought it would be. Um, you know, Jalen Hurts, the Eagles offensive struggles, man. Is that a sign of things to come? You know, they switched coordinators. Um, teams have had a, a full offseason kind of scheme or prayer for Jalen Hurts. Um, and I wish I could say that it's something to take note of, but it's it's an overreaction. Um, there have been a ton of teams that have struggled against the Bill Belichick Patriots defense. I'm, I'm not surprised that having, you know, the last six months to prepare for this game, that the, the Patriots came out on the defensive side and were able to slow them down. Um, I, I would have been more shocked, I think, if the Eagles would have came out and shredded them, honestly. Um, so, you know, week one, weird things happen. Bill Belichick, when you give him multiple weeks to repair level in multiple months, he's going to come out and they're going to at least be competitive. Um, 
so yeah, if you're the Eagles, if you have Jalen Hurts, you know, I mean Smith and uh, AJ Brown still put up numbers, so no biggie there. But Jalen Hurts, especially, yeah, he'll he'll be fine. If he's he's gonna bounce back, don't panic. Eagles aren't gonna have like a Super Bowl hangover or Super Bowl loss hangover or anything like that. Like I think they're still gonna be one of the better offensive in the league. Um, defense still looks good out there as long as they can battle through the injuries. I think the Eagles are still gonna be a huge source of fantasy production this year. All right, and then let's kick it on over to our last game here of the day, and that was my Dallas Cowboys just taking it to the Giants, forty to zero. It was it was beautiful. I, I loved it so much, and so that, I mean, there's not a lot to take away from the Cowboys side in a game like this. Um, you know, defensive and special team touchdowns in the first quarter kind of broke it open to where we were almost right away, kind of playing playing a little bit conservative, control the clock don't turn the ball over and just keep stacking points, even if that means we're settling for field goals instead of touchdowns. Um, I guess takeaway there, Tony Pollard was able to still have a pretty big role, even in a game where we didn't need to lean heavily on him. So if you have him as your RB1, you got to be feeling pretty good. Um, but the takeaway for Dynasty, and I guess even for Redraft here, this one is uh, Saquon Barkley and Darren Waller are the only startable players in the Giants office, offense, and I am taking note of that. I think uh, – if Darren Waller didn't play a position that was so shallow, he would even be questionable in here. But with tight end, his upside, you got to play him every single week. They're they're not going to face a pass rush like Dallas every week, so better days are going to be better are, are ahead for Darren Waller as well. Um, Saquon Barkley, same thing. Really tough defense. He's going to have better days ahead. Um, but outside of that, there is no one. I feel good starting. Like as we saw, there's going to be a bazillion different receivers getting targets. Good luck picking which one is the one that has a hot week when they finally do hit. You know, if you're going to start a pass catcher for me, it's Darren Waller. Saquon Barkley is the only other guy I'm really feeling confident on. And Daniel Jones, I mean, we saw, like, we we said it all offseason. Like, a, a big improvement for him last year was jumping jumping up to 15 touchdown passes. Didn't think he's going to be able to rush and put up the production as a runner that he did last year. And then you saw when they had a pass rush on him, like, didn't even matter how much he's able to run. Like, he, he didn't look great. Um, I guess alternate takeaway there, the Cowboys, if you play in a DST league, they're in the consideration for number one overall. They're going to play like that all year. Um, but, yeah, that'll do it for our week one overreactions. Um, we got Jets, Bills kicking off here in about five or six hours. Excited for that one. Uh, prediction for me, I'll say Bills barely squeak it out 28-27. Um, again, um, hit like and subscribe here so you can catch more videos. I'll be coming every single Monday here with a new video. Um, again, make sure to become a member over at fantasy6pack.net slash plans. Um, while the YouTube videos are always going to be free, there's a ton of other content that our members get over there. Again, best of all, you get access to our Discord forum where you can DM us directly or just tag all the analysts and get uh, custom fantasy advice for your leagues. Um, so head on over there, become a member, like, subscribe, um, and we'll talk to you guys next week.